Okay. Good afternoon. How's your lunch? Good. Good? Cool. Thanks for being inside where it's warm. We're going to talk about threat modeling. My name is Ben Schmidt. I work at Dewalla here in town. So I lead their security team. Um, we protect data and identities. One of the ways we do it um, is sometimes threat modeling. So we're going to go through a model today that I started on SecDSM. I'm also on the board at SecDSM. So I kind of decomposed what SecDSM looks like. Like a cap the CTF that's going on, you're going to see the server that it runs on. You're going to see the environment that does our payment processing. And we'll walk through how we can decompose that and look at something called Stride, which is a Microsoft um, threat modeling process, if you will. Um, so we'll put our hats on together and do some threat modeling. Um, there's no like real good way to do this, meaning there's no like standard ironclad way. Um, I've actually worked with ex Microsofters in a different project and they had a different way of doing it too. So this is a flavor of Stride. You can roll your own and we'll talk about other ones as well. Um, Got to do a little pitch for Dewalla. We are hiring, um, engineering team and kind of across the board. So if you want to talk to me about that, find me afterwards or get my business card and we'll chat. Um, so we're gonna talk about what and why for threat modeling. We'll go through some methodologies. There's a bunch of them. The two leading ones, Stride and one called Pasta, which I don't know a ton about, but it looks pretty neat. Are the ones we'll touch on, mostly Stride. Um, we have a diagram of a, it's a very simple decomposition of SEC DSM and how you could spoof, tamper, et cetera. So that's where we'll do it live, if you will. And I love that Bill O'Reilly clip. Have you guys seen that, the Bill O'Reilly clip? If not, it's always good for a laugh. So I'm not going to use the expletives, but we're going to do it live. All right, and we'll do it live. So why does threat modeling matter? Well, our adversaries continue to innovate. They're constantly changing their game. So process hollowing is a good example of taking code that's um, suspended, if you will, and the code behind it's replaced, and then you have the process running, but it's not, no longer trusted. Um, side channel attacks, Spectre and Meltdown, maybe the good guys found it, maybe not, but it's a side channel attack, domain fronting, so you can um, obfuscate where you're coming from, crypto jacking, which I think is stupid. And I wanted to, you know, you know, whenever you say blockchain or machine learning, you get kind of a snicker out of the group. So I had to do something to get a snicker out of the group. So that's someone with Bitcoin. But crypto jacking, I think, is pretty much dumb. But if you can get someone's browser to run uh, a miner and get some Monero or Bitcoin on the side, which really doesn't work, you can do that. So our adversaries are screwing around. They're always doing new stuff. So we play defense. Um, at least I think we all play defense here. So we have to do new stuff. We can't just sit on DMZs and patching and antivirus and super long passwords and patching cycles. Like that's just not enough anymore. So there's new practices I think are exciting. So you can be a defender and do cool stuff. So immutable infrastructure architecture where you are constantly rolling your environment to keep it fresh reduce your tax surface, and be able to monitor better. Um, deception technologies, I hate that term, but I'm going to use it anyways. This is honeypots are cool again. So a good example is every time you image a machine, you could sprinkle honey tokens on it, like a PDF or an Excel spreadsheet called passwords.slxx that's sitting on your disabled administrator's desktop. No one's going to go there but an adversary. When they do, hopefully they set off a signal or putting honeypots in your environment, et cetera. Zero trust networking. Um, this is really interesting. I used to kind of snicker a long time ago at the Jericho Forum. This is 10, 15 years ago, showing my age. But they started with concept of, well, you should build something that should defend itself no matter what network it's on. So that's a predecessor to zero trust networking. Now that's, you've heard of Google's Beyond Corp, or Duo has certain design patterns where you can put something in an untrusted network. It doesn't matter. Strong authentication and a proxy will save you. Intelligence-driven incident response. If you get your IR plan out and you go do stuff the same time every way, are you really adapting? Are you learning from the incidents? Do you have that tracked as intelligence and can you become faster and better at responding to what adversaries are doing? And then threat modeling. So of these five, the one I want to talk about is threat modeling. So that's kind of the book. There's many other resources, but this is more or less the definitive book. So Adam Shostak from Microsoft wrote that book. I had a chance to meet him a couple months ago, very interesting individual. Um, so I want to talk about his methodology and book and how it can apply to SecDSM. Cool? All right. So what and why? So we're going to get some of this definition stuff out of the way. So I like this um, definition from uh, Brooke Schoenfeld from McAfee. He gave this at AppSec Cali 2018, which we'll talk about in a second. But technique to identify the attack system must resist in defense that will make the system or bring it back to a desired defensive state. It's kind of long, but it's clean. That's what we're going to do today is apply those techniques to 
find what it must resist and what defenses will bring it back. So what are like some benefits here of doing threat modeling? How is it different than scanning or careful design? Well, you can probably find your security bugs earlier because this should be done on the front end. You don't write an application and then say, can you go design a threat model? Like, it's kind of late. So it should be done earlier. Understand your security requirements better. Engineer and deliver better solutions and address issues other techniques will not. A static code analysis tool is not going to do, give you a robust threat model. It'll tell you how your code's doing, but it's going to miss other things. Um, so what's the goal of a, a robust threat model? So if you have to preach this up to the board, what's the goal? Improve security, design, drive testing, and reduce cost. So that's the value proposition. If you're in a puffy chair, what does this stuff actually do? So there are methodologies out there. We're going to talk about STRIDE today. STRIDE is an acronym we'll cover in a second. Spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privileges is what it stands for. Um, there's also a correlating risk assessment called DREAD we'll touch on. Um, PASTA is the other one, and I don't remember what it stands for, I should, but it is another threat modeling approach. It's a little newer, um, but it's more risk-centric, and it's evidence-based. And so I looked at a presentation and some other things, and it's, it's big. It's big and meaty, so we won't talk about PASTA a ton, but if you want to do research afterwards, I'd look at Stride and PASTA. Octave is cool, but it's more of a risk assessment from Carnegie Mellon, who I respect a lot, certs from Carnegie Mellon, they know what they're doing. Trike is older, I don't really see it being used much, but Mozilla was big into Trike back at back in the day. And then VAST is another one, threatmodeler.com, which is kind of a threat model online service, um, has their own methodology that's simplified. But I think focusing on strides is the best thing we should do today for our time. That's the one I know best, so that's, that's kind of why too, right? Is there a template? And I think this is kind of a starting point that's difficult. How do you start doing this stuff? Because Adam's book is deep. And it has like, it goes into cryptography, it goes into all kinds of things. So, can you just give me like a PDF or a template? And the simple answer is, well, they sort of exist, but not really. Um, there's no real standards. Publicly available content varies in depth and applicability, and examples are hit or miss. So the hardest part is getting started. And at AppSec Cali, so I'm jumping ahead of myself, um, they posted their videos a month or two ago, and that's, that was like the theme of the conference was threat modeling. They talked about it a lot. They had a panel. So I think you're going to see more materials come available in the near future. And, I had a lofty goal, I didn't get it done, of putting a template on GitHub, so I'll see if I can get that done too. But OASP is doing a good job bringing people together. So the um, Adam from Stride and a gentleman named Tony, Tony UV is what he goes by, I forgot his last name. Um, he's the pasta guy. They've collaborated on some templates, they just haven't published them yet, so they're coming. Um, don't let it be a barrier. So what is Stride? It's been around a long time. In 2002, there was that famous trustworthy computing initiative at Microsoft, the big memo from Gates, and we're going to take stuff serious. We're going to build security into our products. And they really started fuzzing and doing all these great things. Stride came out of that. Um, Adam had a lot of money and the initiative to go ahead and, and start threat modeling and getting data and, and, and doing this. So it's an acronym of threats. We'll cover each of these, but spoofing, we know what that is, tampering with data, repudiation. So I, I didn't order that Tesla. Chen did. Well, that's a problem. Who ordered the Tesla? They got to pay for it if it's delivered on time. Um, information disclosure, denial of service, elevation of privilege. There's probably a ton of other threats, but this is the, the areas we'll bucket or put them into. All right, so that's the threats. Well, what, what, is, what other things are inside of a threat model? Well, we're going to go through an application decomposition today. Um, we're also going to overlay a data flow diagram, a very simple one. We're going to kind of stop there because we could keep going. This is not meant to be a workshop, uh, nor am I qualified to teach one of those. We'll talk about attack trees. It's another way of thinking about how an attacker's objectives might want to be applied to a threat model. We'll talk about threat actors very briefly, and then some countermeasures. All right, I mentioned DREAD earlier, so we're getting, out, getting through this acronym soup. When you identify all your threats, like a threat is an unauthorized user in the portal of the CTF. Well, what could they do? If you want to actually remediate that threat or prevent it, well, you've got to like rank it somehow, right? <clears throat> so typically, if you do risk management, you kind of go back to the impact and likelihood, which is fine, but there's other ways you could do it. What's the damage, reproducibility, exploitability, affected users, and discoverability? Um, other ways you can look at what that threat could do and what you do to respond to that threat. We're not going to spend a ton of time on DREAD, but I wanted you to know you can go deeper after you identify threats and you want to rank them, DREAD is a good way of doing it. Um, I think when I did it with some ex-Microsofters, we did DEAD. I think we got rid of reproducibility, but 
Anyways, ranking system can help. So if there are threats, what are they violating? So classic security is confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And there's a couple more A's. So CIA 3 is how I'm seeing it now, right? Well, if we map those to the threats, I think it's interesting because it gets us in the mindset of well, how, how, how do we think about the classics here with these new threats, or identified threats. We're worried about authentication, integrity, non-repudiation, confidentiality, availability, and authorization. So that's what's being broken by these threats. A little more on the definition side. Uh, and these are right from Showstack's book. I thought they were worth repeating. And then we'll give examples of each. Spoofing, pretending to be someone or something you're not. Tampering is messing with something, disk, network, memory, you name it. And adversaries now are more in memory than they are in disk. Um, repudiation, we already know what that is, claiming you didn't do something or were not responsible, like claiming to buy a Tesla, but it was really someone else. Information disclosure, that's a breach, that's letting data out to an adversary, denial of service, that's a DDoS, or it could be just spiking and pegging a CPU on purpose. Um, like in college, writing a fork bomb to piss off the TA, you don't do that because you would just go ahead and use a bunch of CPU. An elevation of privilege, allowing someone or something to do something they're not authorized to do. Speaking of denial of service and fork bombs, a buddy of mine um, was a sysadmin in North Dakota, and when the students would do a fork bomb on a shared system, he would lock out their account and make them write a written apology to get their account unlocked. Um, fork bombs are old school, but they're still kind of neat. Okay, give some examples, Ben, of Stride. Cool, spoofing. Falsely claiming to be secdsm.org. You could potentially do that. It'd be hard with certificates, but you could spoof secdsm.org Maybe you get a homoglyph of the domain and make it look like secdsm.org. That's spoofing. Tampering, changing or manipulating a data store. Okay. Repudiation, we talked about a Tesla. Um, I really like one someday. That'd be nice. Information disclosure, a good example of sniffing packets. And if they're not encrypted, then you have information. So if it's an internal trusted network, you can sniff it. That's a problem. Back in the day, and I don't know what it is now, but SAP authentication over the wire was just encoded. It wasn't encrypted, or I'm sorry, hashed. That's a problem. Uh, we talked about denial of service. I'll just do the 100% CPU, but you know, a big DDoS is another example. Uh, and then elevation of privilege. Can you get authorization to do more stuff than what you should be doing as a regular user? Okay, we are done with definitions and acronyms. If you said distill stride down into the, the steps we have to go through as a group, here they are. We gotta identify assets. So you are now helping me write a threat model, a very simple one for secdsm.org. So we have to identify assets. We have to scope this thing. We cannot threat model everything. We have to scope it down. So um, updating website static content, we're not going to go through that. Um, sending a payment, um, we use Stripe. They know what they're doing. They're very good at that stuff. We're not going to go through that. Uh, you have to make assumptions, too. Um, these are examples of um, assumptions. Docker uses Alpine. You've got to refresh your images. The update channels are trusted. So someone's talking about bits and hijacking. I don't know if that's now or later, but bits is an update channel. I assume the update channels are trusted for today's discussion. HTTPS is good, enabled by default with the PKI. It's not self-signed, stuff like that. All right, so before we get to identify assets, they're going to float into an application decomposition. So let's touch on these again. I guess we have some more definitions. External entities are users or actions outside of a trust boundary. And we're going to show trust boundaries in this diagram coming up. Trust boundaries are very similar to an attack surface. Um, it's any area where trust can change. Most commonly, it would be like your hosting provider or a data center um, or maybe a cluster of servers. Entry and exit points, point at which data flows across a trust boundary. And that's a key point. Where data crosses the trust boundary, that's where an adversary is likely going to do something naughty. So that's where the threats, in my opinion, need to be really looked at. Key tech, that's important. The threats against a Microsoft stack are different than the threats against a WordPress stack running on ancient Linux. They're just different. Um, Java deserial deserialization attacks are not going to work on a .NET stack. So that's important stuff. Data stores, this is databases, data at rest. And it's not just at rest on a disk. It could be like Redis or ElastiCache. It could be memory-based data. That's interesting, too, not just stuff that's resident on a, on a disk. Data flows, that's data in transit. WebSockets are always interesting, by the way. Um, and then assets, stuff that's of value. So I'm going to keep going here. Now the basics are out of the way. So let's begin in a very abbreviated threat model for SecDSM. 
So here are the assets SecDSM has. And again, I scoped it down. So we've got a server. Um, it's over in Germany. Uh, we have some domains. Those are the ones that are most interesting, in my opinion, for today. There's other domains, but those are the three that are interesting. Uh, CTF is what people are playing right now. It's CTFD running on there. Um, anyone know what Jenkins is? CI server. So it's a server that's kind of powerful that does automation, build, stuff like that. Pilot is the test site. So when we upgrade stuff, the pilot branch is committed, and then you can see it on pilot. That's public. You can see that stuff. Uh, we use bitbucket.org, so that's where source code is to run via Jenkins to do stuff. We do some stuff in Azure for some cryptocurrency stuff, some hosting, some of the CTF assets might be there, so there's some Azure stuff. Um, our money's at Viridian Credit Union, we like them, but that's an asset, probably important. Um, we use Stripe to move that money over debit, debit, debit and credit rails, and then the ACH the money into Viridian, so that's important. We use G Suite, so if you were to fish us or try and screw around with domain fronting, Google's an interesting way to do that. Uh, we have an ATM. Uh, it's actually set up in the CTF room to screw around with. We're not going to talk about the ATM today, but it's an asset. Um, and then credentials, database, API, log files, et cetera. So these are the assets that I think are in scope for a pretty decent threat model. All right, now I have to create an overview. I start to get ready to decompose this thing. So let's walk through this. So this is pretty simple. The dotted lines, and I hope you can see them, are the trust boundaries. So this is my interpretation of SecDSM. So uh, let's start in the upper right at Viridian and kind of go counterclockwise. So Viridian has checking and savings. Inside our checking account is where money sits. We're a very transparent organization at SecDSM. There's about $7,700 in there. Um, not much in savings. G Suite, we have some dry, you know, same stuff you'd have in your drive, some docs, presentations, um, the ability to have email accounts. In Azure, there's some servers and hosts that do some cryptocurrency stuff. Uh, some CTF assets are there, and then MISP, we're working on standing that up. So there's some hosting stuff in Azure. Stripe has an API that the SecDSM website can post to, to issue a token, and then eventually a payment against a debit or credit card which then at the end of the day clears, and then when it finally settles back, it ACHs into Viridian. We'll talk about that. People on the internet are important, so they're in green, browsers and SSH clients in particular, and then Atlassian. So Bitbucket is hosted at Atlassian. On the right, the SecDSM application and server. So it's actually at least web. This is one machine that hosts multiple things. And this could be dangerous or could not be dangerous, but we don't have a lot of assets that are super interesting. So. Main website, secdsm.org, pilot websites there, CTF websites there. There's more, but let's just stick with those three. There's some website data and a little data store, and Jenkins also runs on the same box. That's technically dangerous, but we're a security nonprofit. We're here to test things and make fun and have a good time. So Jenkins runs there. So our CI pipes in purple. Main host instance is in that kind of like light orange, and you've seen the other um, providers, if you will. So that's the simple decomposition. Where there's interesting data that I think could be considered a valuable asset, there is some cryptocurrency in Azure. There's real money, fiat currency, sitting over at Viridian. And Jenkins might have some powerful stuff, too, like credentials. So we have a very simple architectural overview. Now let's go ahead and decompose this sucker. So what I said just before, let's just look at it visually. And you're not going to see Telnet. You're not going to see NTLM. This is mostly a Linux stack with maybe some Windows in Azure. So. Um, when we interact with Bitbucket, let's say we check code in, for example, I guess I'll show the SSH for that. Um, webhooks take over and tell Jenkins to do stuff. So that's HTTPS, that's a post. Internet clients, meaning any of us that need to do work, if you're authorized, in green, you're going to go ahead and SSH into the instances themselves that are running in that kind of light yellow in the application server, or you could be going into the Azure stuff. No big deal there. Is there any RDP up there? Maybe? No? No RDP. Okay, cool. Then my diagram's accurate. Um, lots of HTTPS. You're seeing that browser connect to everything over HTTPS. If you saw HTTP, like, that'd be a really easy threat to say, what are you doing? Stripe does a simple ACH uh, sweep over into Viridian, so I'm not going to go into Stripe too much. That'd be a fun threat model, but they're, they're good at what they do. I think we should focus on SecDSM. G Suite, HTTPS, Viridian, HTTPS. Pretty simple. Any questions on this about the technologies, the stack? 
It's pretty much a LAMP stack over here for the uh, lease web server. There's some Ruby, there's some PHP, Apache, Linux, probably some Python natively. I don't know if we removed that. No questions? You're all right with this so far? Antoinette. So we certainly could. In this case, we're looking at data flows. Okay. We'll see. I've got examples. So I want to kind of do threats together. But if not, I'll throw them up there and you'll see. We could also scope it out to say, listen, we understand that if we're running ancient um, PHP, that's a problem. So the threat would be um, either availability or we'll go through that. But I kind of scoped it out because if the threat is we're not updating, then we're just doing a bad job. Let's actually go to like some more interesting stuff. But it's accounted for either in your scope or you can make it a threat itself. So let's identify some threats. Um, so I mentioned threat agents. I'm not going to go into depth on those. But what are some threat agents for um, SecDSM? Like unauthorized internal or external users. Maybe there's authorized users. Maybe um, my authorizations are good, but my intentions are bad. Um, it could be a SecKC member. We're friends with SecKC. Um, but we don't want them screwing around, so I put them here as a threat actor. But these are potential threat actors that might help us with this threat analysis. SecIC isn't a threat? SecIC is not yet, <laughs> okay. but they're on, they're on notice. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up. So <clears throat> let's go through some that I identified, and then I want to stop. I'll put the diagram back up, and let's see if we can get a couple in the room. Make it interactive. We'll try. So if we look at Stry, let's start with spoofing up top. So where could spoofing happen? And I'll show that I should have like a dual screen for this in the diagram. So I looked at this and I said, well, Jenkins is important. Jenkins scares me. That's a server I'd go after. And I'm not necessarily a very good, uh, I'm a terrible pen tester actually. So Webhook sent to Jenkins with false build instructions. That could happen. So how would we prevent, how would you prevent that? Well, you could sign your webhooks. If you sign your webhooks, then if Jenkins is smart, it validates them. And if they're unsigned, that we can go ahead and ignore those. So that's one example of a threat. Screwing around, sending bad webhooks to Jenkins, and we can go ahead and sign those things. And that's pretty common with an API, so cool. Um, brute forcing. So this is more of a simple one, Antoine. It's not vulnerability management, but can you brute force stuff? If you put a web form in the internet, it's gonna get hammered all day, like we know that. So could you brute force Jenkins, Viridian, or Azure, where we think assets live? Well, sure, you could do that. There's a way to prevent against it. You could throttle them. You could throw a capture up. You could do lock off, lockouts over a threshold. There's a bunch of techniques. Device fingerprinting, certificate authentication. Let's just say <clears throat> multi-factor auth solves that problem to a certain extent. Pretty good mitigation. By the way, I'm a fan of YubiKeys and Duo. I'm not a fan of like SMS texts and stuff like that. Or like email. That's a terrible one. Like we're going to email you a second factor. Like an adversary wouldn't already have your email. Um, tampering, and we can go back to this. I'm just going to list these so you kind of get your mind in the mode where I am. Well, what can I tamper with? Well, I could tamper with some of the network traffic back here. So all that traffic is protected with cryptography, so that makes it kind of hard. Um, why is it protected? Well, we're using strong TLS, so it's better than version 1.0 and 1.1. It's 1.2 with appropriate cipher suites. Almost 1.3, can't wait for that to be out there. Uh, downgrade protection, HSTS, so it's harder to man in the middle, although not that hard. Nick, you showed me how to do that. Thank you. Um, repudiation. Could a rogue website update happen? Well, maybe, but we have forensic logging in place, so we could find out if it did happen, how to recover. Detective control, but it's fine. Information disclosure. What if one of the services failed to open? Like we configured it wrong and just pukes um, something to the website. So use a user can see like, oh, that's the stack. Oh, their job is old. And then from there, gain information, do bad stuff. So these are examples of threats that I identified. There's probably a ton more. This is something I did really quick. I've got more, but I want to kind of pause and go back to the diagram and see if everyone in the room can find like spoofing, tampering, information disclosure, denial of service, or elevation of privilege. Anyone see one of those threats in this diagram? And the areas to maybe look for is where a trust boundary is being crossed or where assets live. So spoofing 
to Viridian. Let's look at that two ways. So if we want to spoof, um, okay, let's look at that a couple ways. One could be, you know who the treasurer is. So on the SecDSM website, Aaron Tkip is the treasurer. I used to be. Oh, really glad I'm not. It's a hard job. Aaron's the treasurer. And so Aaron has the ability to authenticate to Viridian. So if we can spoof Viridian to Aaron, we can capture his credentials and potentially stop him from getting in. Let's look at it that way. We'll talk about ACH in a second too. So how do we counter that? We have multi-factor enabled at Viridian and we have device whitelisting or fingerprinting also enabled at Viridian. However, the second factor at Viridian is SMS. So the threat of spoofing Viridian to Aaron would mean you'd have to fish Aaron I'm just walking through, this is kind of an attack tree, we'll get to that in a second. Fish Aaron, or present a bad website to him. Have him log in, and maybe we're using Cred Sniper or something in the middle, and we have the ability to capture his SMS text that's very fishable, and then log in as him. So that is a threat. Um, how do we counter off? Limited access, multi-factor to Viridian, that's okay. But, <clears throat> sure, that would scare me. On the ACH side of the house with Stripe, it's kind of out of scope, but ACH you typically uses um, SFTP IP whitelisting at a minimum. So it'd be kind of hard, maybe not impossible, but pretty difficult on the back end. That was spoofing. Any, any information disclosure? Any uh, tampering? If not, I've got some more. We can come back to this later. But what I find when we do this, all of a sudden, one person says one, one person says another, and all of a sudden you've got a bunch of evil geniuses helping you go through this thing. So I'm going to keep going in the interest of time, but we can come back and do more of these later. All right, so information disclosure. How about inappropriate use of crypto? This, this pisses me off. If there's one thing that makes me angry is installing crypto poorly, either rolling it yourself, which you never do, choosing really, like, talking to primitives directly, choosing ancient things, Pasting shit off Stack Overflow, this makes me angry. So, now that I said that, how do you implement cryptography properly? Well, it's very hard. You need good people and standards to do it. But here's the things that I would say are good countermeasures. Appropriate cryptographically secure pseudo-random pseudo number generation. So you're in dev you random. You're not using just a random call in your, in your framework. You need to talk to a kernel mode source of entropy, period. Um, require authenticated encryption. So we are not using old school AES with CBC. We're using authenticated encryption. That's GCM. You have to use authenticated encryption in 2018. Uh, proper generation, rotation, and storage of cryptographic keys. So if you have the keys committed to GitHub, that's a bad thing. Don't do that. If you can't rotate your keys, that's something you should think about doing. Uh, if you have an event, you have to rotate your key, keys. Well, that's a problem. Implementation of forward secrecy, which I think is super important. So like right now, um, if you don't have forward secrecy enabled and it's TLS protected, like an adversary is probably not going to crack into that. But if they've been recording it for the last 10 years and you don't have forward secrecy enabled and they're able to factor a big RSA key in the next 5, 10 years, all that data is potentially viewable. So forward secrecy is important. Password hashing, this one pisses me off too. If I see MD5, or I see a munge or some self-rolled, like this is just terrible. You have to use a key derivation function-based password hashing algorithm. Argon2, Scrypt, Bcrypt, and PBKDF2 are the four I would use. Um, constant time functions, most of this stuff is fixed, but um, if you have certain functions and they're not returning constant time, like it takes longer to uh, decrypt a string than it should, if you're going character by character, like, well, you can figure that out. So these are things you should just, I'll stop talking about crypto, just gets me angry. Service exhaustion, um, well, you can have performance tests, associated resources for scale, you can handle demand. Um, or if someone's naughty, you could <coughs> capture them, do a bunch of stuff. DDoS to a TCP listener, well, use a cloud CDN, hire, harden your IP stack, um, so Akamai, Cloudflare, et cetera. Elevation of privilege, so this is a vulnerability, Antoinette. Um, if there's a software vulnerability via memory corruption, that's a problem. And then you could go ahead and hop from running as Apache to root, potentially, let's say that. That's a bad deal. So implement software in a memory safe language. So using Go would be maybe a potential mitigation if you want to program in Go, it's memory safe. Uh, what's another one? Oh, 
committing stuff. So in this case, what if we accidentally mark something in Bitbucket as public and we're committing key material or something? That'd be terrible. So how would you handle that? Well, rotate your credentials and have tests and monitoring for that. Because it's also information disclosure. So we'll come back to this, but does this give you a feel for when you look at an application decomposition, you look at the data flows, and granted, this one's very simple, how you can look for spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, elevation of privilege, and denial of service in the wrong order. You could deny service to someone trying to update the website by hitting the Jenkins server repeatedly. No one can access Jenkins, and then they can't update the website. Absolutely, because we require that. So like Jenkins is the only way to update the website to the next point. So if Jenkins is unavailable, website is stuck. Can't do anything. We had to put a pink sombrero on. That's from an earlier talk. Pink sombrero is going into prod, which you shouldn't do as root to fix something. But yeah, it would make it unavailable. So it happened today, actually, really piss everyone off because then the CTF next door would be probably running really poorly. See, see how this gets going? This could be fun. So we could probably do this for an hour or two. And if we had a really like much more robust application decomposition and data flow, I think we'd come out of here with a list of threats and potential countermeasures. So thank you. Beal? Uh, just a question. Have you guys seen, just based on the popularity of all the cryptocurrency hacking and all the stuff that's going on out there, have you guys seen the Azure box getting hit very much? Because not just DDoS to mess with you guys, and that's with mine, um, in potential to... My, you know, my answer is I don't know. Yeah. I'm not involved with that. I just know it lives there. It's just, Maybe you know, I should it's be. It's Slack channel, and so anything right. you want an insider thread information. Um, a, a good amount of that um, is actually mining SecKC coin. Yeah. Um, they have their own fork of Litecoin, and we screw around with them a lot. So technically, that's worth nothing but lulls. But it's possible. I don't administer those systems, so I can't give you a good answer. But like we could do this for a long time, but I also got to get through the slides here. So awesome. That is exactly what I wanted to have happen. Let's go through a little bit more, and we'll kind of wrap it up, I think. So attack trees. We kind of talked a little bit about how would we go ahead and mess with Aaron, who's the treasurer. Well, we could, we could fish him. We could do this. So everyone know who Bruce Schneier is? Pretty well-known cryptographer. Um, He's the first one that talked about attack trees, formal method of describing security systems. Um, I think it's complementary to Stride. I don't think it's different. You start with the root node, what's the adversary's goal, and then work your way down how to achieve that goal with different steps. You have duplicates, you prune the tree, and the ACFE fraud tree is really neat. It's huge. I'm not going to go through it, but it's how to commit fraud at a company. It's very interesting. So let's say I want to steal data from SecDSM. How can I do it? So I, I made this up the other night. Okay. I can intercept email. Well, how would you intercept email? I'd gain G Suite access. How would you gain G Suite access? I'd do a password reset. Well, how'd you do a password reset? Well, I'd do a phone number port for SMS so that when I forced a reset and I got my second factor, I had Nick, Nick's uh, number ported because he's at, I don't know, a telco that didn't do good authentication of the user. Or I want to obtain backups. How do you obtain backups? I do an account taker over at the backup provider. Well, how do you do that? I spear fish them. How do you do that? I use cred sniper. So these trees can get pretty detailed. I'm not going to go into all the nuances, but it's another way if you're stuck on how you could think about what's an objective and how would it happen. All right, this is awesome, attack. Um, so anyone here? Well, first of all, you know what the CVE database is, right? Okay, so MITRE is a big reason why that's around. Um, and Adam Showstack, the guy who started threat modeling in, in Stride, um, was a good part of that. So I was at a conference a couple months ago and the two of the people who are in charge of attack, the adversary tactics, techniques, and common knowledge uh, project gave a talk about what attack is doing. And it's fascinating. So like this is one of those nuggets where you're like, I'm tired, I've been at B-sides all day, I want to go home, I need some coffee. Like, remember to go check out the attack framework from MITRE. It is full of matrices, or matrices, if you will, plus also different ways of looking at attacks. Um, that can happen. They have very, they're a very enter, enterprise flavor, enterprise-ish flavor to them, but there are 437, there we go, techniques in there. So if you're thinking about like 
what would I use as a library of attacks to look at how I build a threat model? Attack is a very good one to use. They also have other assets at attack. They have adversary emulation, where they have taken an APT actor, like APT, it's a low one. They're working on 29, I think it's APT3. And they say, this is how you emulate this adversary. So if you're on a red team, that should be like required reading. And it walks through every step they would do in the kill chain, every technique they would use, and how you'd emulate that, t that technique with Cobalt Strike or Metasploit. So it actually puts you in the driver's seat of a real adversary and how they would attack something. And that can be factored into what you're using for threats. So we talked about process how long we've begun. That is in the attack framework. Uh, browser extensions, those are a pretty interesting thing. They're not always clean. Um, I kind of cringe when I see my parents' browser extensions and I gotta clean them up. So those are various things you can factor into your threat model. So I'm kind of getting towards the end. I guess I'm going a little faster than I thought, but what is the goal of a robust threat model? Again, this is the elevator pitch to someone in a puffy chair. Improve security design, drive testing, and reduce cost. You do not do it at the end of your project. It's probably like, anyone here in a red team? No red teamers, okay. Uh, I am not in a red team either. I'm terrible at that stuff. But if you build an app and it's going out in two days and they ask you to pen test it, like, that's just terrible. You don't do that. You do that earlier. Um, same with the, the threat model. This is a design time practice. Um, it takes discipline to do it, but it, it's a good process early on. Um, and it's pretty open-ended. Again, I walked you through what I think works in Stride. The book is, I don't have the book here. I should have brought it. Um, there's pasta to look at, but if you start with a diagram, a data flow diagram, and then look at Stride against it, that's a good way to start with this. Um, and then publishing threat models. There are not a lot of these are published. I have some really good links. I think the references here are very good, so I'll put those up shortly. But publishing your threat model is rarely done. Um, I'll name two. I'll name one really good one. Um, OAuth two, the OAuth two framework. It's actually a. It's a framework. Um, their threat model is published as, as an RFC. It's not very visual because RFCs are nasty. But it's a really good example of a threat model that's pretty detailed. I just wish I had diagrams. The five pillars of a successful threat model by Synopsys is outstanding. Um, it's a much bigger version of what we did today, but it shows threat actors, um, data flow, assets, external entities, trust boundaries. And what they did is they put their security controls at the bottom. So when you see the threat actors, and we kind of did it with our countermeasures, so multi-factor, well, that can be a control that you rely on for a certain threat which is kind of neat. Um, the pasta stuff's at the end here. I think they're recording this so you can view this stuff later. Um, the videos from AppSec Cali are really good. I recommend you consider watching those, they're free. Um, and then if you wanna learn a lot more about pasta, there's two different resources that are really deep I have here at the end. So 40 minutes, okay. I am ready for questions. If you have them, I'll do my best to answer. Mr. Stark. You mentioned uh, selling this to uh, the guy in the puffy chair, right? So what kind of like pushback, or what are, what are common arguments or concerns that that person has when you're trying to sell this? I, there's three that come to mind. One is it's hard to explain. If you've never seen one, what the hell is a threat model? So is it just gonna slow me down, et cetera? So I think you have to show them the value. And if you say, well, this is gonna reduce paying a pen tester like, let's get rid of the low-hanging fruit and let's have them really earn what they're doing in a pen test. If I get a pen test for a damn cookie that isn't marked secure, we're doing a, a bit, bad job. Getting all fired up here. So one is to show the value there. Um, the second is it is going to become, in my opinion, a leading practice. Um, they're not published. You're going to see more and more of these published. To me, this is like risk management version 5.0. Like, this to me is like your risk register is cool and impact and likelihood is cool, but it's kind of a back office thing. Like it doesn't necessarily become a rudder in a project. It's how you manage risk. You produce one of these, I think you're gonna have much more value in your project. And the last is people actually get excited when they start doing these. Like it gets your engineers excited to work with you on mitigations versus here's a Veracode report, go deal with it. Like that's just not the way you do business in 2018. Um, my team, for example, sits with engineering. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't do that but it gets the two teams playing on the same level, same, same playing field. And engineers are problem solvers by default. They're the best problem solvers I think I've worked with. 
what you're giving them is a fun problem and you walk away with kind of like a joint effort and how you're gonna mitigate that stuff. You're not gonna mitigate everything, but those are the value things I would share. Um, I think eventually it'll be expected, not necessarily a compliance requirement, but I think it'll be expected. So like, it could even become useful collateral. When you, when you wanna buy from a company, they'll give you a SOC 2 report, or they'll give you maybe like a redacted version of their pen test, or maybe something else. If a company gives you a threat model, no one does that. That's something I want to work on doing, actually. So I think there's a whole bunch of reasons. I could probably think of more, but those are the ones I would give in my elevator ride. Yeah. So, so this has, uh, you talk about a lot of technical, te technical controls and, and the attack of the platform. Um, they have threat models take into account uh, human attacks and social engineering. Uh, they can. I don't think we had time to do that today, but for sure. I mean... And it kind of an example of this. So anyone done segregation of duties, like in a big system? That's kind of a big pain in the ass. Super important. It could certainly fit that. I think if we spent more time as a group threat modeling, we'd certainly have a whole section of human risks. <clears throat> I just didn't think we had time to get to that today. But um, when you go back to those threat actors we talked about, there's more, I'm sure, than what I listed here. But how could each of these threat actors um, either be affected or affect the system. And I think those human elements would come into it. Um, have you played with the OWASP uh, Dragon threat modeling tool at all? I think no. it came out like a year ago. I've heard about it, but I've not. I, I saw it like an early beta and it seemed kind of rough, but it looked like it could be, it was kind of like to kind of build and suggest connections in the diagram you were showing. It looked kind of cool. I think it's on my list to do some research on. Okay. Um, Microsoft has a threat modeling tool as well, and it's pretty old, and it doesn't really work well, and you need like all these .NET dependencies. I think this is just like a Java app. Or yeah. Else. So, um, short answer is no. The other, the other thing that's goofy too, like you could use UML to express a lot of this. Yeah. Um, like, uh, where was it? You could use, and so like, one of the individuals that does a lot of these, it's like you use Plant UML. It's ancient Java. It kind of scared me. Like it in and of itself was a threat, but I think those tools and templates need to become better. Yeah. Um, but short answer is no, I've not played with that. But okay. I will. I got one more question. Um, so like, if you go back to that, um, if you go back to your kind of model that you had. Yeah, that, that one. Okay. So I was kind of thinking like, um, are there some attacks that are maybe kind of cross the boundaries more? So like the man in the middle example we're going down, <coughs> I think it satisfies all of those um, all of those categories, like you have information disclosure, you have privilege escalation, you have um, spoofing, right? Um, are there some things that kind of fall in that category where, it, I mean, it just compromises everything? A mega threat? Um, yeah. Probably. I don't have a great answer for that one, but yeah. like some of them cross, what, what were we talking about? Um, the stack trace failing open, and that's information disclosure. Well. It can mean a whole bunch of other ones, too. Right, because what is in the stack? <clears throat> yep. Yeah. yeah, for sure. So what I've seen, and I've done like three or four of these, <clears throat> is that typically you get a, like a raw list of these, and then you actually start combining them. Mm. And then you do that risk assessment. You could use Dread or you can use your own. And if they start crossing, I would start building them up and then put that thing way up to the top as I remediate them. Yeah. It's not like a built-in thing in the framework, but it's more of as you normalize the data, I would just be like, yeah, and I think, I mean, the point of the stride wasn't really to maybe categorize the threat. It was to kind of more help you have a process to enumerate the space and be systematic about it, I think. Um, I not agree with that. Not necessarily to categorize it post-mortem, I don't Yeah. I think this stuff's still new enough that we're going to figure that out with templates. Yeah. Which is why I really wanted to see those templates that Adam and Tony did at that last AppSec meetup. They had five of them. They just didn't publish them yet. Sir. Yeah. How do you manage the treadmill effect where you're, you know, you constantly got, you constantly got that upkeep? Yep. You know, to me, that seems like your threat modeling has to be, I mean, not daily, but, mm -hmm. you know, you're not, you can't be static, and that's, you know, it's a hard, hard thing to sell management on, to me. Mm -hmm. The order to sell client or whatever you're, you know, I paid for this already, you know, I already paid for this. I 
think it has to be part of a process. Like anything else, it needs to be upkeep, up, up kept. So for me, I do it based on new features. Um, you're still doing vulnerability management and all the other stuff and pen tests. That doesn't go away. This is on top. But I think as you add features to a system, you should adapt it. That, that's my, my gut response to you. But it usually is based on an initiative. And then when the initiative's over, will it sit there? Sure, it'll sit there. And you need the discipline to update it. Usually that's when you add features. That's a pretty good answer. Um, it takes discipline, and they, they do sit a little bit. But like a risk register should not sit that long. It shouldn't sit for your once a year sit down what scares us meeting. So that takes discipline to update that thing a couple times a month. Um, and these will get to the same point, in my opinion, over time. But it takes discipline to get there. It's a tough question. Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the biggest thing. I think we are out of time. We got five? Okay, we can do a couple more questions, but I'm learning from you. I don't have all the answers for this stuff, so I'm glad we're having this talk. So, I mean, I think I know the answer, but where do you stop the scope of this? Like, you didn't go into DNS, you didn't do your certificate authority for your SSL, you did like... Yep. Is it just when I run out of time and money, or...? Well, <laughs> you know what? Let's look at that other one to show you one that I thought was really well done. So this is a much bigger one, and I guess I should have put this in the presentation, but uh, I didn't. So let me see if I can zoom in here. They start going into much more depth. I knew if it was too big, we would just get stuck, right? But they should be bigger, and you shouldn't. I guess you have to figure out which scope you're going to pick and how much stuff you trust. Yeah. But in this case, they don't trust browser plugins. So like, I don't trust Flash. Like, Flash scares the hell out of me. Um, even JavaScript doesn't cover off. So the different threat actors um, are in yellow, and the actual controls are in green to mitigate those. Um, but even here, they don't go down to the lower protocols of DNS, which how would I cover off on it? Well, I use open DNS, or I have a trusted DNS provider. I use cloud for privacy, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, I think that just takes knowing what value you value the most. Mm -hmm. But this one goes a fair amount deeper, and I kind of like this one because you have the browser, the server's broken out, Different reports. They don't say which company it's for, but they did a really nice job with this one. And then I mentioned the controls at the bottom. It gets kind of noisy, but they have those listed out. I take the, take it back. Yellow's assets, red is threat actors. So I think you can go deeper. Like ODBC, well, that's a database connection. That's interesting. But they say TCP. They don't have the port between the widget and the app server. So I think you have to do what fits your organization. Mm -hmm. But had we a lot more time, I would have probably broken it down to additional protocols. I do worry about DNS. People forget about it, unless it's down. <laughs> Versions of stuff. Um, yeah. the question, what is, what do you think, or maybe this is a group question, what's appropriate for documentation to show outside auditors and, and other interested parties that you've done this analysis and you've not done over analysis, but you've done the right amount of analysis? So I wanted to have my template ready. I okay. put it on GitHub and release it, and I didn't do that. But essentially, overview up top, um, what the scope is, what assumptions you've made, so you level set. Then after that, you go through um, that diagram. You overlay the data flows, and the diagram should be as big as it has to be, but no bigger. And then after that, 
a table with at least stride, and it's the reduced stride. After you've done it and gotten your raw notes, you know, sticky notes, whatever you want to do, then reduce that thing down to the ones that matter the most. And then how you're going to have a countermeasure, rank those, and then after that, a revision history, who was there, and then how they're ranked and what you do with them goes into your separate system for prioritization. That's at a minimum. The question then becomes, that's cool, it's an internal document, how do you then publish that thing? How do you give it away? I don't have a great answer yet, but the, o the OAuth 2.0 RFC related to the threat model is the best I've seen. So getting these things published, I'm really excited to maybe try doing that, but also watch others that do it. This one's normalized, I don't know which customer it is, but it's their example. Well, we gotta close it up, but I'll catch up with you later. Thanks for coming after lunch, I appreciate it. Have a good one.